Hey everybody, welcome to the webinar today. My name is Scott Fincher. I'm the Data Science Community Manager here at NIME. Uh, I'm glad that you could all join us uh, as we are going to talk about today automating away spreadsheet tasks with one of our trusted NIME community contributors who I'll introduce you to here in a moment. Before I do that, uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of housekeeping. How is all this going to work? So uh, if you're looking at your screen now, you should be able to see a couple of different tabs. One here is the chat tab where you can just interact with other folks that are here uh, watching the stream too. Uh, in fact, post right now where you're joining us from. We typically have people from all over the world joining for these events. Um, so let us know that. That's on the chat tab, but you probably what you really want to know is where can I ask questions, right? And so you could use the Q&A tab for that. It's right next to it. We'll have some Nimers behind the scenes that will be answering your questions live in the chat. Uh, and if you ask a really interesting one, <laughs> then we may hold it till the end and answer it live with a couple of our speakers here. So uh, please do send in your questions as you think of them. We really want this to be uh, interactive when we get to that part. Now, it's the internet, sometimes things go a little weird, right? So if you have trouble, just a few suggestions here. Um, make sure you're using Chrome or the Firefox browser if things get a little laggy or choppy. Um, you can always try a browser refresh, switch over to a hardwire internet connection if you're using Wi-Fi, uh, try private browser mode. These are all things that you could do to improve the experience if something starts to go a little awry. Uh, but once you make one of those changes, and you come back to the site, click on the stage button there on the left-hand side, and that'll bring you right back into the live portion of the stream. You'll get caught up uh, right where uh, we left off there. So what are we going to be talking about today? Um, the first and probably the largest part of the presentation here will be how do we automate repetitive spreadsheet tasks. Um, that's with Brian Bates, who will be joining us shortly. Um, I'll have just a really short presentation on how you can output and create static PDFs using a new reporting functionality that's in labs in the newest version of NIME. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, so that's where we're headed today. Glad you're here to join us for that. Uh, having said that, let me bring on our speakers and introduce them to you. So Brian Bates, uh, he's a data and integration architect here. He's contracted at Disney. He's going to be showing you all the magic today for the majority of the program. Um, and then I'm, we also have Emilio Silvestri, who's a data scientist here at NIME. Um, he'll be uh, collating the questions and uh, bringing them together so we can collect and, and ask the good ones. So um, guys, you just want to say hi real quick and introduce yourself so we can put a face with the name. Hi there, I'm Brian. Brian and Emilio. Hello, everyone. See you later for the Q&A. Enjoy the webinar. OK, so Emilio will be whisked off into the, the magic portal. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Brian, and he's going to show you uh, what he's been working on lately with NIME. Brian, please take it away. OK, thanks, Scott. Um, thanks for inviting me along. I'm excited to be here, and uh, thank you all for uh, coming along. I hope it uh, turns out to be a useful uh, webinar. Um, yes, my name's Brian Bates. Um, I'll give you a quick intro of who I am in a moment. But uh, first of all, I'll just go through what I'm going to do. After the said introduction, I'm going to describe a scenario where uh, maybe using Excel at the moment for processing files each month and to process them would require maybe some complicated VBA in order to make it a, a repeatable task um, because things change on a month by month basis. Um, then I shall go through and do a demonstration using NIME to show the kind of things that, uh, that we can do to um, help with that kind of uh, uh, problem. And finally, um, if my voice lasts out, uh, a grand finale, uh, if I get that far. Um, so wish me luck. But uh, but first of all, yes, who am I? I'm still Brian Bates. Um, and anybody who's uh, who's used the NIME community forum uh, may well have seen me occasionally on there uh, under the name TechBB. Um, I'm currently a data integration architect um, working at Disney, uh, where we're using NIME to um, perform tasks such as database comparisons, extractions, and we're moving um, Oracle data up into Snowflake. Um, I've personally been using NIME for just uh, two and a half years, so I'm a relative newcomer um, to NIME. But my um, IT uh, life started uh, back in 1985, a time before Windows, uh, when I was actually a COBOL programmer. Uh, this was hailed as the language which was going to be an end to the need for um, programmers. Um, so I spent the next couple of decades or so being a programmer using other languages. Um, but my data journey probably started around about 88, 89 when I first learned uh, SQL. Um, that's a technology that has come to 
um, endure and evolve um, over the time. And another thing that's endured and evolved is, um, is Excel itself. Um, back in version three, it was pretty primitive compared with today. Um, but since VBA was introduced into it in, um, in version five, I think I've been trying to avoid using it ever since. Um, in my time, um, I've, well, I suppose I, I've moved over to um, data integration about 10 to 15 uh, years ago um, as my, my uh, job evolved. Um, and in my time, I've worked um, for the likes of British Telecom, the UK's Channel 5, uh, the BBC. I've worked with the Accenture um, at Facebook, now Meta, of course, and, and of course, uh, Disney. Um, and I've, uh, I've mostly spent my time uh, living and working in the London area, but I did have a, a couple of years out in New Zealand, which you should visit if, um, if you ever get the chance. So without further ado, let's uh, discuss um, the problem uh, scenario that uh, we're going to look at today. If you can imagine you've got um, some Excel files that you receive um, each month. In this case, we've got product list and sales list. So product list is um, a series of products with their product codes and uh, price information. Um, and uh, you've got a sales list file, which is going to be maybe a set of um, invoices. So um, looking at the, um, the product list, we're looking at the June data here. This data all comes for courtesy of uh, ChatGPT that I had a little bit of a conversation with and got it to produce me some data. Um, but the June data, we look at this, uh, this file and we think, well, it's not too bad a state for processing. You know, it's, it's, um, it's in a tabular format. OK, it's got this thing called sales tax sitting at the bottom, but generally that's, that's not too bad. And we compare that to what we receive um, for July and realize that um, there's actually some um, interesting differences um, which are going to cause problems potentially. We've got things like the uh, the table names, the product code, product and price um, has moved from being the very top of the file to uh, a little way down it. Um, the sales tax that I mentioned a moment ago has moved from the bottom to the top of the file. We've got uh, somebody's decided to put titles um, down so there's extra noise uh, through the file and also uh, the top and the bottom has got uh, some additional uh, information that's that's thrown in. Um, and then we look at the sales list uh, for June. So the sales list um, is um, essentially the uh, set, of, set of invoice numbers um, with a date and it's got a product code on there and a quantity ordered. Um, and we look at it for July and it's not that far different, a few extra rows. But then we come along and look at the August thing and we have this familiar story again that somebody's uh, got a little bit creative. Um, and decided to put some more titles in. Um, and there's an additional um, thing that we have to resolve um, that we quite commonly see that in order to make something more readable for people, um, instead of putting dittos, just leave blank spaces. Um, but when it comes to processing, um, that's problematic. And we've somehow got to um, fill that information um, down because um, that's not uh, so easy uh, to process. So that all, form, all um, forms part of the data preparation um, process that we need to, to go through. Um, but in, as well as that, we've got um, a thing called data enrichment. Um, so our sales list, um, for example, has got these product codes on it. And we want to have the details about what those products are, because that's not potentially that useful to us um, by itself. And the information for those, those products is held in the um, product list file um, for that same month. And the idea would be that we go and find the particular product code in the sales list file. We look across, find the product and the price that that's related to, and return all that um, back into uh, one uh, record so that we can um, process it and potentially do some other um, calculations um, upon it. And all of that um, scenario is, is data enrichment. So that's the um, bringing data across from one uh, sheet and putting it um, into another. So let's move on to actually um, the demonstration where we want to do that um, in NIME. And first of all, I'm going to look at the, the product file. So this is a set of things I'm going to be um, going through. Um, so we're going to bring in a product file. We're going to try and clean it up. And we're going to try and move that sales tax into somewhere where we can uh, calculate uh, that as well. So I'll just switch across to my NIME screen. So this is 9511. Um, and um, if you haven't seen it before, it's, um, well, you can download this uh, for free from the uh, NIME uh, website. Have a play. Um, I'm going to create a workflow um, in it. I shall call it uh, Demo 1005. 
which is actually today's date, but it feels like the number of times I've practiced this demo. <laughs> um, and the first thing that we want to do is to, to load in some um, Excel uh, data. Um, now we could, over here on the side, we could bring a, um, what we call a node across from our repository, the palette over to the side, and I could drop an Excel um, reader node onto the workflow and configure it from there. Um, but because I've got my Excel data sitting already available for me, what I'm going to do is bring across a couple of the products. And I can just drag them in from my um, Explorer, um, bring across the product list for, say, June and July. And I should just label these up, actually. Um, so I know which one is which. So that was June and that one was July. And if we look at the, um, the details for uh, July, Um, we can see that um, we've got we've got the data come in, um, but we don't know much about what that data is. Whereas if we look at the June one, um, because the June had the product code, product, and price rows right at the beginning of the file, uh, NIME is able to just take those and say that's what the table's uh, column headings are going to be. It tries to do that for July as well, but um, but it it doesn't know. That the products um, titles or the, the column titles are, are further down the file. Now, what we want to do when we're trying to um, do any kind of automation is to standardize the way we're going to process things really quickly. So we don't want one file to be where we have to specify where these are going to be and the other one uh, not. And if we go into the um, July um, file, I just bring up the configuration for the July file. Um, we could, if we were doing this manually, we could go into this area and we could say, um, for the column names, use the particular rows um, in a in a so use the the row at a particular position in the file, but we don't want to do that every time. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tell Nime not to use the values from any row um, and to have it come back as just A, B, and C. And by doing that, um, it means that we can standardise that when we first read the file, it's always going to be A, B, and C. And so even though it's got it got it right on this occasion for June. Um, I'm going to do the same there. So again, it's A, B, and C, and we've standardized now um, what's coming in. We know that our columns are always going to be called A, B, and C, um, and we can then do something um, with them to process them. And if I just um, run these, execute these two, we can see we've got product um, the columns A, B, and C there. But of course, we do actually want to find this product code table within the Excel um, spreadsheet. And so, uh, Nine provides facilities now. Um, there's a new node in this version of Nine. So the first new node that I'm going to be introducing is called the Table Splitter node. And the idea of the Table Splitter um, is that uh, you tell it um, some criteria by which you want to um, uh, find or locate the the, the table within the, uh, the the file that you've got. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the table that we're interested in starts wherever you find the word product code in column A. So that would then work for both June and July. So um, in the table splitter, I do that by configuring it and um, saying in um, column A, I'm looking for product code. And I want, um, so what I was going to do is I'm going to produce two, two output tables, everything that's above product code and everything below it. Now, because we want to bring the, um, the product code heading into the table that's coming out, we actually want to include the product code line, the line that is found within the bottom output table. And hopefully, if I just run this, you'll see what I mean. The, um, the, the two tables it produces are denoted on the, um, on the node by these black triangles. And the top output table is everything above where it had product code, which is these lines here. And the bottom output table is product code onwards. And if I do the same, just drag the June data onto there, and we can see that that's now done the same thing. The bottom table is, has got the code, and the output table at the top is empty because there was nothing ahead of that. So that's all good. Um, we've, we've got a point now where we can, we can say that we've got a, a table, the, the bottom output table on the table splitter will now definitely have that row at the beginning of the table. So we then want to do something where we say, make that row the table headings and nine provides us with a node i can just drag out from here and it provides us with a node and it will it will make suggestions about what the next node you might want to use are in this case it's got it right the next node i want to use is the row to column headings or sorry row to column names um, uh, node 
And the configuration on that is really quite simple. Um, I just say how many nodes ahead, so how many rows ahead of that, that heading um, are there, and do I want to discard them? Well, there aren't any rows because it's the first um, row there. So I can just execute that. And now we've got a table here with product code, product, and price. And likewise, if I did that for um, the June data, um, again, we've got the table with product code, product, and price. So we're already getting to a point now where we've got some kind of standardization. Following this, we want to now make sure that everything that's in our table is the stuff we want, and we want to discard anything else. So all of these noise things that we were um, seeing at the beginning, um, things like office furniture, I don't want to have it in there. Um, so the trick, the trick at this point would be to find something where you can say, these are rows that I want to have included in my, in my actual product code table, and all the other rows um, I don't want to have included. Now, it could be that um, you want to pick up the fact that they've all got a price or they've all got something else. Um, in this case, I'm going to make use of um, something called regular expressions. And the reason for doing that is uh, there's a lot of people that, that, that shy away from doing them. So if you're one of those people who you've never used regular expressions or even never heard of them, um, I would definitely suggest that if you do anything with data, you get at least a basic understanding of them uh, because they're really um, quite powerful. Now, the regular expression, um, I, what I can do is I can add a node called a row splitter. Um, and this allows me to define the rows which are going to appear to be in my table and those are going to be excluded from my table. I could use a different node called a row filter at this point, which does kind of the same job, but the, the, the beauty of the row splitter is it tells us both the included and excluded rows, whereas the row filter um, would only tell us what, uh, what's included. So we, we can't really sort of double check that we got it right um, afterwards. So with the row splitter, um, what I want to do is I want to look at the product code um, column and I'm going to use a regular expression and this will be quite a relatively simple one. Hopefully, even, even if you've never seen them before, this will be relatively easy to understand. So, and this is where I say you could learn some, some basic ones. So I want something that starts with a letter um, and it's going to be an uppercase letter. So the regular expression for that is A hyphen Z, basically it reads as A to Z and you put it in square brackets to say it's going to be a letter in this class A to Z. And how many of those um, are there going to be? Well, there's going to be two letters. So I put in curly brackets two. So it says something that starts with two capital letters. Um, and following that, I want it to have uh, some numerics. And if you've followed me so far with what A to Z is, identifies letters, you can probably guess that numbers can be identified by zero to nine. So any digit can be zero to nine. There is a slash D, but I think the zero to nine is actually more readable and certainly easier to, uh, to learn. And I could say it's going to be um, followed by three digits. So that would identify anything that starts with two, two letters and is followed by three digits. Um, I'm actually going to change that and use a plus sign, the plus sign being um, regular expression notation, meaning one or more. So um, if we run that, we should find that this um, has included all of the rows which have a product code if that of the format we've decided, decided on. And on the lower output table, it'll be the filtered out, and that's everything else. And that looks pretty good to me. So there's, there's basically, we've got into our table now uh, the items that we want. Following that, um, so our upper, upper output table here is the filtered ones. Um, we can see that price is currently held as a string, so character data, even though it's got numbers, because the table itself, when it first got read in, had all sorts of other things in it, um, NIME has uh, got it recorded as a string. So we want to change that. Um, and to do that, um, we can use a node called um, the uh, string to number. And string to number, you can pretty much guess that that's going to take a string and try to turn it into a number. I only want that applied to apply to the price um, column. And I want to turn it into a double. Um, if you're not aware of, um, of geek speak, uh, double is um, a decimal value as opposed to integers and longs, which are both integers of varying uh, scale. Um, but you can remember, if you, if you remember in the English uh, tongue, D for double is the same as D for decimal. So you might remember that a double in these terms means a decimal. So I'll just OK that. And if I execute this, we find that so price is now a double. So that's great. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to do on this was include um, sales tax against each product line for future calculation. Now, sales tax um, was a value which appeared um, here 
um, on the input file. But when we were looking at the June input file, sales tax appeared way down below. Now that's going to be a, problem, a bit problematic because that means that um, on one file, sales tax is appearing out of this little node up here. Um, but on the other file, if I were to execute this, we'd find that sales tax is appearing uh, down here. We don't want that. We want to have something that's, that's standard for both our files. We don't want to be having to write stuff that says if it's this file, um, bring the sales tax in from one, one place and if it's the other file from the other. So just going to touch up July again. Um, what we could do is for something like that, we could say, well, we want to get rid of sales tax out of the equation before we start splitting our table. We could use another row splitter for that. So if I just drag a row splitter across, I can drop row splitter onto that line and it'll attach it in for me. And I can say um, in column A, I'm looking for uh, the word sales tax. And I happen to notice, um, which might not have shown up, um, the sales tax on one of those had a colon after it and on the other one it didn't. Um, so I'm going to say if it starts with sales tax, so here I could use a wildcard um, as opposed to regular expression. Uh, wildcard is fairly simple for, for trivial things like that. And I'm going to exclude the line, which means that um, if a row has sales tax on it, it's going to come out the bottom output of the row splitter. Everything else will come out the top. So I'll apply that and uh, run this. And now we'll see that filtered out sales tax appears down here. And if I drag the node from this one, um, we'll find that the filter out sales tax still appears here. So good, we're gradually getting to a point where we've got uh, something standard, but we still want to put our sales tax on the end of this line. And the other thing is that sales tax currently is a string, just like the uh, price was over, over here. Um, but this string contains a percent sign. And so we can't just do a string to number on it um, because that doesn't handle that. What we can do is um, we can manipulate that string. Um, and to do that, there is a node called string manipulation. There are other ways of getting rid of this, but I want to bring in the, the string manipulation node. Uh, string manipulation is uh, one of NIME's uh, low code nodes as opposed to the no code. Um, now, low code means you've got some formulas and expressions you, you write, but, uh, but string manipulation is fairly easy to, to understand generally. Now, what, it, what I want to do is to um, the, the sales tax is in column B, and I want to remove the percent sign um, from it. There is a remove chars um, function in the string manipulator, which is quite useful for this. And I can say, I can just double click on that and bring this in. And I can then make sure the cursor is in the right place. Double click on B, because it's in column B. And I can say what it is I want to remove. And so I want to remove the percent sign, and I shall call this sales tax. But not only that, I want to convert this into one of those doubles, a, a decimal value. And to do that, there is a to double. Um, and I could double click on that, but I can also um, type it. Um, there's a to double function. And if I wrap that around this, this says remove the percent sign from that and then turn it into a double. Um, so that would become now 10 or 10.0. But I don't want my sales tax to be recorded as an integer. I want it to, uh, um, so as a, a number such as uh, 10. I want it to be represented by um, 0.1 in this case because I want it to be the actual percentage value. And I'm doing that here because I want to demonstrate that you can also do some quick calculations, simple calculations in string manipulator as well. So it's not just for, for strings. And if I apply this and OK it and run this, we'll find that sales tax now has appeared as 0.1. Uh, on the end of this this row. We've got all the other stuff there, but we want that point one to go on to the end of the row over here. Um, so, so that we then have it available as an extra line or an extra column rather um, on each line so they can be used in calculations. To attach one row from one table onto all the rows on the other table, um, there is a node called cross joiner. Now cross joiners um, can be quite an expensive operation because what the purpose of cross joiner is, is it says I'm going to take all of the rows on the top table and I'm going to match them to all of the rows on the lower table and append the columns from the lower table on each one of those. So that, that's quite an expensive operation. If you've got a thousand rows in each of these tables, then a thousand multiplied by a thousand combinations is going to be one million rows come out the other end of here. Uh, so you don't want to use it lightly unless you, you, know, you might have a need for doing that, but, um, but mostly um, you wouldn't be. 
Um, but in the case of joining one rotor to this, then the output is going to be that one row multiplied by the, the rows that are on here. So um, the cross joiner is actually perfect for this. And when I run the cross joiner, all of the columns that are on the output from here um, have now been appended onto this output here. So we've got sales tax here. But of course, we don't really need these other ones. Um, this, this, the other items, they are effectively rubbish to us now. We, they have served, they've served their purpose. And what I'm going to introduce is another node. I could, I could use at this point a column filter just to say um, filter out everything but, um, so filter out the A, B, and C um, columns from here. But instead of that, I'm going to introduce a new node um, called the uh, table um, cropper. And if I drag this onto uh, the line, uh, the table cropper, again, another node that's new in 9.5.1. And the purpose of the table cropper is to um, crop a table by both uh, rows and columns as opposed to just by columns. Now, it's a slight overkill for what I want to do here because there is only one row, but I, I just wanted to introduce the, the node. Um, but the what I do here is I say, I want to just keep the columns starting at sales tax and ending at sales tax, and then specify the rows also that I wish to keep. So I say from row one to row one. And that's quite a useful node. There, there will be times where you want to just take a specific section of a table, and so you can just um, pull it out um, like that. It's literally like cropping an image. Um, you just specify where you need. And when we run this, we now just have sales tax. And if I now run the cross joiner, you can see sales tax has been added to the end and the other columns are no longer there. So I'm just going to label this um, sales tax and product. And I'm going to put a, an annotation around all of that just to keep it um, clean, just uh, call that um, product file. And that's our product um, file um, brought in in a standard form, regardless of whether we use the June data um, or the July data. We've now got something, in spite of the differences to start with, we've got something that comes out the other end, which is the data uh, that we want to work with. We then want to do something similar with the uh, sales file, but um, because of uh, time constraints, I've um, put something together to do some of what we've seen already. Um, and I've got another workflow sitting over here called Demo Resources, um, where I've got some pre-built um, items to speed things along a bit. So I'll just highlight that and just Control C, go back over to my demo. And um, by my calculations, that means it's going to have to come in about, probably about there. I just paste it. Um, got that slightly out, but that's close enough. Um, just move that down over there. So the situation with this one is that we've got the sales file, which is, um, so it's been configured to bring in the particular sales um, item here. Um, we do much the same as we did before. We've told it to just bring in the whole file in A, B, C, D, E without trying to find column names. Um, we can then split it like we did before um, and the output table contains, you know, so we split this time on invoice number and we do the row to column names. So nothing you haven't seen before. So at this point, we've got something that's got the uh, the correct column names uh, for the file that we're interested in. But we've got a complication. We've got items here uh, which are blank and we actually want them to be populated by the items that are above because they've been left blank for humans and not blank for computers. But to do that, we've got a node called the missing value node. And I can put a missing value node on. And if I just double click on that to configure it, you can tell it what to do on a general basis for everything that's missing for strings, for example. Um, but what I can do is say for these particular columns, sales date, region, and invoice number, I want to fix that value by taking the previous value, which is the previous um, non-missing value that you can find in each column. And if I do that and apply it, we find that there are missing values have now been replaced. And if I just click between these two to compare what it's done, you can see that where, where it's needed, the missing values have been um, filled down. 
I then want to split our rows like we did um, for products. This time we're using a regular expression again, but on invoice number. So the invoice number, uh, this might now be familiar. You should be able to read this from the last time. Uh, a letter, three letters followed by one or more uh, digits identifies an invoice number. We want to include those rows. Um, but we've got a thing here called sales date, which we've not seen before. And we've got another node, another item over here, which we want to change the, the, the data type for. Sales date, we want to turn into a date from what it's currently as a character string. So I can use a string to date and time node. String to date and time node is probably one of the, the nodes which causes us the most uh, fun on the forum because um, there's often little gotchas um, with the way that people are, are looking at this node. Um, one of these is you need to specify that I'm only interested in it being a date for a start. Um, and then I can guess, I can tell it to guess the data type. Now it's going to get it right this time. It's, it's had a look at the, the data that's there. And that's a very guessable data type because um, it's in, in standard um, year, month, day form that, uh, that say Excel outputs or that, that NIME is expecting to input. Um, but if, the, if it can't guess the data type, you can select a data type from the list. But the reason why this node appears on the forum quite often is that people don't realize for some reason that even though you can select an item from a list, you can also just overtype it. So if the, if the, the format you're looking for isn't there, you can overtype it. And I'm, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to overtype it with a single M and a single D, which is actually my preferred um, method because a uh, single M and single D will match both two and one digit months and, and days, whereas a uh, two M's and two D's uh, enforce that it has to be two digits with a leading zero. Um, one little gotcha um, for people coming from Excel is that a capital M means month and a small M means minute. Um, whereas in Excel, a small M can be used for either and it works out in context. If you need to know what the different uh, format masks are, you can press this or go to the help um, and you can look down and it tells you what the different letters um, actually uh, mean so there are little emmys minutes and so on but we'll apply that um, and i'm going to execute it and that's now quite happily turned those into a local date data type and then finally for this part we want to convert our quantity um, into a number and this this time it's going to be an integer because we're not buying half of something we're going to buy whole things and we've now got um, a an invoice or um, a sales file, which is again in a standard um, format. So that's the second uh, part done. Uh, we then want to um, enrich our um, data that is uh, coming along. And to do this, we want to bring across the information from the um, products file into the sales file. We're going to bring across the product description and price as well as uh, a region name and a thing called the product category, which I'll um, look at in one moment. So let's just uh, switch back over here and I'm just going to move us down. So what we have, we've got two files we're going to be processing. Um, we've got at the bottom, we've got our products file, our catalog, if you like, and at the top, we've got our invoices. We want to update the, the uppermost um, file here or, or table here. And we want to do that by looking up values from the lower um, table. Now to look up values, we can use um, the um, value lookup node. This is um, a node newly introduced in this version. Uh, there were other ways of, of looking things up, um, notably the joiner node in um, previous versions. Um, but the value lookup um, is new here, um, is very, very powerful now. Um, some of the power is, is hidden, as you'll find out in a moment. But the value lookup works a bit like a, an Excel V lookup um, or an X lookup. And what we do here is we say we want to look up a value and we've got the top table here is the, the, the data we're trying to look up and we want to look up the product code and the lower table is what we call the dictionary table. So we're going to look up an item in there, which also happens to be called product code. And then we say what it is that we want to return um, based on that match. And we can say what we want to do if, if it can't find a match, whether to go for the next bigger or the next smaller. But I want to return the product price and sales tax. I don't want to return the product code because we've already got uh, that. And if I execute this, um, we can see that um, we've now brought in the product information for each of the products uh, that are there. So that's really quite nice and, and straightforward. Um, but I've got some additional uh, lookups that I wish to do. And I've got this little resource here. Um, 
chuck control C across, control C and paste that down here. So I just joined that into the value lookup here. The first one is um, a set of regions. So this is more of the same bit like we did for product code. We're just going to say for the region code on this output, we're going to match to a region code on this table and return the region name. And I'll execute that and the region name is being thrown on the end. But the second value lookup I've got included here um, is one that is very um, useful um, for, for specific occasions. What I've got here is, is a, um, a node called a table creator, which is just allows me to put in some static data rather than bring it in from uh, an Excel. So you might have some kind of uh, update that you, you just manually uh, wish to do. But in this case, I'm saying the products have a product code which starts either IT or OF. And I want to tell, bring in details of what product type that is. So anything starting IT, so that's IT asterisk uh, is information tech equipment. Anything starting OF is office furniture. So I wish to make that um, change. But when we run it, um, what happens here, we can see that it's not actually finding a match. And the reason for that is, of course, our product codes don't have IT asterisk in them. They have IT followed by some digits. So we can't do a straightforward match. What we can do, though, is use a hidden, slightly hidden away feature. You have to go down to show advanced settings. When you press show advanced settings, this little panel in the middle called string matching pops up which gives you additional options for matching. We can do reg uh, regular expressions, wild cards, or substrings. And in this case, I want to do a wild card match. And when I do that, it tells it that it's going to match a uh, product code on here with a wild carded product category. And if I execute this, we find that it's found the product category with that wild card and the product type has been brought across. And these match up to the different uh, product codes and product categories there. I'm just going to remove the um, the product category. Now it's just shown that it's done it. Um, so we're just going to bring in product type, just re-execute that. And that's our regions and our product uh, types uh, brought together. And then we wish to do some calculations. So um, I want to calculate um, sales tax and so forth. Once again, I've got a resource um, squirreled away. Um, so this calculations here. I shall bring this across, control C. I've added a little bit of writing on this. I'm not going to go into much detail on, on the writing, but it was it's something I, um, in putting together this demonstration, I thought was worth noting, especially for people coming from Excel. Um, so Excel has a, a function called round for rounding arithmetic, which I think is particularly important if you ever do divisions or multiplications by decimals, uh, because you can find that you can be billionths of a penny or a cent uh, out with your calculations and, and something doesn't quite equal zero and then you sit there wondering why so I, often with excel i put in a round function um, now nine has um, a similar uh, function um, and what i'm going to be doing here is multiplying the quantity by the price by the sales tax in order to work out what the tax amount is and the sales tax is 0.1 and i want that to be um, rounded to two decimal places so to um, put that in. I've left that at zero for a moment so I can show you how that, that works. Um, the rounding is done by one of these functions here. And if you come from Excel, you might think, oh, I just want to use the round function. And that will that will work. Um, but you might find you have some very slight occasional discrepancies with Excel because actually the, the round function um, isn't quite the same. The one that matches the Excel rounding is round half up, which means round, round the 0.5 up to, up to the penny rather than than down. Um, rounding has a slightly different algorithm called round half even is also known as uh, banker's rounding. And the idea is that depending on whether something is even or odd um, in its rounding, it decides to round up or down the, the halves, um, which is designed to uh, remove some of the um, cumulative effects of rounding. Um, but you can read up on that or ask me on the forum at some point, and I can point you in the direction of um, further information. So I'm just going to put in here um, that what we want as our calculation, quantity times price times sales tax, rounded to two decimal places. Uh, it's going to be returned as tax amount. Say OK to that, um, execute it. And down here, whoops, down here, we can see that uh, tax amount has been calculated based on the, the values um, associated here. Uh, sales value, um, I'm not going to type in the calculation, I've already got it here, but it's simply the quantity multiplied by the price, also rounded to two decimal places. 
and the um, the sales value including tax is the sum of those those previous two. So when we run those through, we can see that we've now got these added. And the nice thing about NIME is you can see each step of the way um, what it's doing, um, as opposed to trying to work through formulas and things thinking, okay, what, what was it that caused that number to occur? And you, and it doesn't matter how many rows you've got, there's, there's still, you know, it, it just applies it across all the rows um, that are there. So that's our, um, that's our calculations done. Um, I now want to introduce um, aggregation and this is here to introduce yet another new node. Um, I want to aggregate our sales by the regions that we've now got. And I also want to get a grand total um, for the whole uh, month. The new node, um, again, for this, this version of NIME is the row aggregator node. Um, there's also a group by node, which was the older version, which is, it does other things. It does more aggregation types, um, but the row, aggreg row aggregator is actually really useful for very quick uh, um, filling in of aggregations. So what I do here is I say what it is I want to aggregate by, and I'm going to say I want to aggregate by the um, region name, and I want to do a sum, so make sure sums ticked, and then tell it which which of the columns I want to get an aggregation value for. And I just want to have um, sales value, so I'm going to bring that in, and I also want to have a grand total um, value. So. Um, we've got the grand totals are going to come out on the lower output port, which will liven up once we run that. And if I run this, we'll see that we've got the region name and the, the sales value there. And we've got the aggregation um, for the on the lower output port, the grand total um, for the, the whole month. I would like to have those two values on the same um, output table. So to do that, I can use the concatenate node, bring those across here. Um, and apply this, and now it's put the it's stacked the upper table on top of the the lower table and produce one single output. So we can see that the region name is left blank and the sales value is matched up because of the column names on here. Once we've done that, I would actually like that not to be blank. I'd like to put in something called the period label. And what I want to do here is um, extract the period label that was in the sales file. Uh, which you may not have spotted, but right down the bottom of the sales file for the purposes of this demonstration, uh, there is a item which, according to uh, the spec that I would have written, uh, this is this is we're saying that the the very last row on the um, sales file, the first column of the last row is going to contain period um, value. Obviously, it could be that we have to go and find that somewhere, but for the purpose of this demonstration, this part, uh, we're going to say it's, that's always going to be there. And I want to find a way of extracting that. Now, this allows me to introduce another new node called the cell extractor. And the cell extractor um, does exactly what it says on tin. It takes one cell out of a table um, by whatever you've configured it as. And we say, I want to extract from the first column. And I want to extract the last row of the first column. Um, I give it a row number. But if I want the last row, I count back from the end. And I can say it's the first row counting backwards. Um, so that will generate me um, an output table containing that period value. But it also generates a thing called a flow variable. That's this little red node. And you'll find that the flow variable nodes prop up on all of these. But that this specifically creates a flow variable. It's got a little red node um, dedicated for it. And that, that variable is called extracted cell. And it contains the value that has been extracted. So what can we do with that? We actually want to put that in over here onto the end of this. And to do that, we can use a um, another node called the cell updater, um, which kind of matches. This is another another new node for this version of NIME. On the cell updater, we tell it where we want to put the value. Um, so I want to put it into region name. And again, counting back from the end of the table, I want to put it into um, the last row. But I need to tell it what, what to go in there. And what it tells me here is I need to give it a, sli uh, a a flow variable containing that cell value. So this, the flow variable I want is way back down the other end of the spreadsheet. Now I can drag this line back and I can just move the move the workflow by using the cursor keys um, on the keyboard. And I'll drag that line back to there. And then if I head back over um, to the cell updater, I can um, take this value, I'm just gonna move it up there so it's a bit tidier. Um, I can take this value and I can now tell it I want that extracted cell. OK this, run that, 
and we now have my period value in there with the, the information we want. So once we've got that, what do we actually want to do with this? Well, um, you know, it could be that you want to write it to Excel. You could be write, you're writing out to some other files um, for other processing. Um, but the, what we're demonstrating here is that we've got something which um, can now be run for um, different uh, periods. Um, and it should be able to handle some interesting differences between the files. But we're going to write that back out to Excel um, using an Excel writer. And that Excel writer, I tell it uh, where I want to uh, write it to. Uh, my K drive, uh, monthly sales.xlsx. Um, I can tell it to create any missing folders. So I can get a whole list of folders and create them if it would exist. Overwrite the file if it, so create them if they don't exist. Overwrite the file if it does exist. And tell it what um, the uh, spreadsheet or the sheet name is going to be. Um, I'll also size the columns. And I'll set it to open the file after we've executed it. Um, but I'm not going to excuse it just now because one of the other things I want to do is bring in the details um, for the um, for the month. Um, so if I just bring that across, move those out of the way over there. Um, I want to bring in these details for the month, and I want to send them um, to that file as well onto a separate tab. And I can create a tab simply by dragging over here, and a little plus sign appears, and drop that on there, and then I can double click on there, configure it, and this, I'm just going to say sales. I'll apply that, and when I execute this, um, we should find Excel opens, and we've got uh, two tabs, one containing region summary and one containing sales um, with all our data. So that's that's the um, point where we can say, okay, we've got uh, Excel um, written to, and that's that's great. But I want to move on to a second part, which is ease of use, because at the moment we've got um, a situation where Yes, that's great. We've got something we can run each month, but we have to go and configure our Excel um, files each time. So I go and put June in both of those or September. That's a bit of a pain. Um, now, I haven't really got time to demo how this bit um, works, but what I've got is um, the ability for the um, users to select um, a file and have it uh, determine um, what, the, what the other file will be. So just to Make, make sense of what I just said. Um, on this first node here, I've got a list of files and folders. And I can tell this to look in my data file and look for any files that start with sale list and something with a wildcard. So this will return me a list of um, files. Here they are. And then I've got another node which I've configured to say, um, if I open this, say open view. And, you, and on this, you can select a file. So I can go and say, select the September file. Close that and apply the new default. This here is a meta node, um, which I've got a, a load of other nodes I've put in. But basically, what they do is they say, given the file name I've just received, work out what the what the period is and therefore what the product um, file would be. So um, this kind of thing can be written as a bit, bit involved for um, a 40 minutes uh, demonstration. Um, but um, if I just click back to the demo, um, but at the end of this, this generates another of those uh, or two more of those flow variable things that we saw with the cell updater and the cell splitter. And I can put attach that flow variable to here and to here, and then I can configure these. This is to demonstrate the kind of thing that you can do. Um, and I can say into this first one, I want to use the particular flow variable path, which is the sales list. This is the sales list. And I can apply that and say, OK. And into this one, if I configure this, I can do much the same. And for this one, I'm going to say um, I want to use the variable product list. And that will overwrite wh whatever has been um, selected uh, there. So when I've gone in here and I said I want to select, I think it was September. So September is selected. When I go to the far end and run this, this will now open, and here we've got the September sales and the products that have uh, come in for September. So that's that's great. Um, now it's not particularly tidy that that file. So I've got a couple of other resources I'd like to um, to bring in um, things that can be done. One is tidying up, and I've got some additional. So I'm going to bring both of these in because I'm running very short of time. Um, I think I might have even run over my time. Um, so I'm going to bring these in. And just to show, again, the kinds of things that you can do, 
um, here I'm going to um, run something which is going to um, table manipulator, very powerful node, allows you to reorder columns, rename columns, hide columns, um, and you can move columns up and down um, by, by dragging them um, here. You can tell it to, not to show certain columns, um, and I could change the, the name of a column um, by changing the description. Um, and you can also actually change the, the data type um, over there. Um, but I've just thrown these in just to, to show the other other things. The sorter allows you to sort your rows, so I can specify in here the different types of um, sorting I want. So first sort by region, then by product type, then invoice number, and so on. And if I run that, that will um, produce this um, output in sorted uh, order. Um, and the um, one additional thing I wanted to, to add on was um, I want to take my details of the um, of the month and I want to add an additional aggregation so I want to aggregate the month and um, for here I can say um, I don't want to aggregate by anything I just want to aggregate everything and I can say I want to aggregate the tax the sales value and, and, and sales tax and so on and I can concatenate that value a bit like we did with the row aggregator over here but I can concatenate that value onto the end of the output table from here um, and I can generate that as a new sheet, which I'm going to call um, sales report. And if I do that, we've now got sales, um, we've got the sales and the sales report. And you can see that that's put the totals uh, down the bottom of those columns. So that was that was pretty much it. But there was one one last thing, if I may, if I just uh, can uh, go one step further. Um, this is the grand finale moment um, with with NIME. NIME is basically a data tool, and um, and it's not really there for uh, formatting Excel. But there are um, community nodes out there for Excel formatting, which I haven't really got time to go into. But there's the Continental nodes, and shout out to the guys at Continental, and also um, there's the Right to Excel template. Uh, both available on the community hub. Um, and shout out to AO, um, another fraud user for the AF utilities. Uh, the continental nodes are quite an a, a, um, extensive set of nodes for adding formatting to Excel worksheets. And the Excel right to Excel template adopts a different approach, which is you set up the formatting in an Excel spreadsheet and then write your data to it. So there's two approaches. And I just thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could just end the demonstration with um, a couple of um, additional um, things here. If I could make it so that people didn't have to learn all of the uh, formatting of the continental nodes, um, but that they could still apply something. And it could also demonstrate the um, kind of uh, components that can be written. And so I wrote this component for this webinar. Um, I wrote it a few weeks ago and I've been testing it ever since. Um, but if I drop this component um, onto the workflow, and that just shows how you can drop a component onto the workflow and I join the Excel writer up to that component. Um, I just have to execute that component. It has to do some configuration of itself. Um, then I come in here and I tell it that I want to create a new variable containing the path. I'm just going to call it XLSX path. And I no longer wish to open the file after execution. Um, but I will execute the node. I then configure this. And I tell it, I'm going to use the XLSX path. I'm going to freeze the, the top row. I'm going to change the heading to 20. Um, the heading text I'm going to make orange. Um, the data font I'll leave as that. The data row text I'll make uh, blue, one of the blue, um, cadet blue color. I'll do some alternate banding and have some special formatting where I'm going to reverse the header and background text. But I'm only going to apply that formatting to um, a sheet if it, it starts with the word region. Um, or is um, sales report. I think it was called sales report, hopefully. Um, and I will also highlight um, sale value. And I will open it at the end. I could change the date formatting and so on as well. And this would be the grand finale moment if this works, um, because the output from this spreadsheet hopefully is now. There we go. Oh, very nice. We have nicely formatted 
and we can see that we've got a total line on there formatted and the last line on that one isn't the total and the total line on there is formatted not something you'd necessarily want to do if you had thousands and thousands of rows um because that might take a bit of time but um but for the the quick and dirty um knock up a spreadsheet that you want to send to somebody um that should hopefully do it well nice so, thank you That's... yeah thank you brian I, I wanted to add on maybe a, just to supplement what you showed there you know what are we getting at at the end of this you were showing basically a pre-formatted um, excel um what i wanted to show you if uh, they can bring on my screen is is kind of an alternate method just very briefly because we don't have much time here um to how you could create your own report using visualization nodes in nine <clears throat> and what i have here is basically this data some a summary of the data that Brian had already presented in his the previous portion of the webinar. Um, we're basically just spitting out some numbers for these different regions, sales numbers for August and September. Um, and I can show you the result of this component I created, which shows together in an interactive bar chart. I can mouse over and see these various values, um, a couple of different pie charts that show both the, both the August and September regional sales, and even the tabular version of the data down here. It, this is not so much to show you that um, this particular visualizations are all that interesting about the sales data because it's very simple data, right? But it's more to show you about what the possibilities are within NIME to be able to combine multiple views all together. And then ultimately um, using a new feature in NIME 5 to be able to export this as a PDF and make a static report. So right now we have an interactive report where I can click around on things and you know, I can highlight and and this is great if I have, you know, NIME Analytics platform, but if you need to send this to your boss and create a PDF, you can do that using this report PDF writer labs node, um, which I've already pre-executed. But if I go actually look at the results, you can see here this report has been generated. So um, how did I do that? I don't have time to go into all the details, but if I go inside this component, you can see that it's built using various NIME nodes. So I have the bar chart that we saw, both of these pie charts, uh, the table view at the bottom. I even formatted the numbers in a particular way so they look nice and consistent. And then I added a header at the top. Once I bring all these nodes in for the important parts of the visualizations I want to show, then I can use the layout editor, which you open in the top left here, to actually drag and drop these in. So I made sure to put the pie charts next to one another. I put the table view down here at the bottom. You know, there's this header at the top. You can arrange this however you want, right? It's completely customizable and up to you. You want to put these visualizations together in such a way that they draw the eye, um, you know, where you want your reader to focus, right? So I just did that um, using that layout, put it inside a component. Um, you can preview the component here within NIME and then ultimately write out that PDF. So uh, we have some examples on the hub about how you can do this with probably some more interesting data than what I just threw together in a few minutes. But I did want to highlight this to you because it's new and we're really excited about the potential for being able to very quickly create targeted reports using nodes that you may already be familiar with from using NIME. Um, so having said that, I'll stop that portion. Um, and let's look a little bit at some of our questions. So maybe we could bring Emilio back on right quick uh, to help us answer some mm -hmm. of these questions. Hey, Emilio. Um, so we've we've had a, a packed um, webinar. I know that we've covered a lot of ground here. So um, maybe one of the first questions we could ask here, this is for Brian. Um, this is specifically a node question. Um, Brian, would you always prefer to use the row splitter instead of the row filter, and or or not? Like, what would what would you say there? Um, I would say that on balance, probably yes. I would I would generally use the row splitter if it's if it's something that if, if I'm just doing something quick and dirty and I just want to filter it out, then then that's great. Just yes, use row filter because you don't need the other bits. But for something that I want to to be able to look at later, you know, you, you're repeating it over several. You know, maybe maybe several times a, a month or or whatever it's, whatever it is, you want to still make to make sure that you're not filtering out something you weren't expecting to. So I think it's just useful that you've got the the extra table there to to look at, um, just to inspect occasionally. Okay, very good. Um, a question for you, Emilio. I'm looking That's at my other. I think we lost Scott. <laughs> Quickly, he, he Oh, we back. did. But it's very interesting. Yeah, I I think it's a statistic thing using one or the other no scott are you back yes i hope so yeah. <laughs> I, okay we sorry about that, if there was a glitch there 
Um, yeah, I, the, the next question I wanted to direct Emilio to you was, uh, do you have any examples available, apart from what we've seen today, uh, about spreadsheet automation, um, maybe for those folks who don't know enough about NIME to create this all from scratch, but still would like to give it a try? Uh, sure, yes. We So we want people to escape from this spreadsheet uh, hell, as we call it. So yes, we, we came up with a lot, lot of examples. You can find a lot of them in the NIME Community Hub. We have collections for this. We have even a space full of examples. And maybe some of our NIMers can type that in the in the chat later. But yes, we have plenty of examples to let you get uh, to get you uh, started with automating spreadsheets with NIME. And we'll do one more question here. I see one in the chat. Um, for This is for Brian. Um, how or is it possible, I guess, maybe we don't have time to show it, but how can we extract a date from an Excel file name? You know, a lot of times you'll get a whole series of Excel files and it'll say, you know, September 2023 in there, right? Is, is it possible for us to easily get that information and set it aside and use it later? Um, yes, well, it's certainly possible. Um, in fact, within the... Um, Within the component or the, the meta node that I included, I had to do just that. Um, and if you talk about an actual date within the file name, then basically you would, yes, you can, you can, um, there are nodes. Um, if somebody wants to come onto the forum and <laughs> I can give some examples at some point. Um, but yes, you can, you can basically take the um, path uh, name, you can put that into a variable, you can then use a, a string manipulation on it or regular expressions to, to find the, uh, the part of it that contains the date. Um, hopefully, you know where in the string the, the date was. Um, and then extract it out. Um, but yeah, um, come find me on the forum and, and I'll give some ideas. Cool. Well, that, that's actually a good transition because I have uh, just a couple of slides here. I think I want to clean up uh, more housekeeping before we wrap. Um, so if we didn't get to your question, sorry about that. We'll, um, we'll try to follow up with you on the forum. If you come to the forum, we'll have a thread dedicated to this webinar uh, where we can try and tackle some more of those that we just didn't have the time to get to today. Um, one thing I did want to ask is if you've used NIME and you're enjoying your experience, uh, if you could write us a review on Trust Radius, we have a link here um, that you'll get with the slides when this gets sent out in, in the follow-up email. Uh, drop us a quick review, let us know, um, you know how you're using it, what you think of it for the benefit of other folks. And then lastly, um, if you haven't had a chance to download NIME, we would encourage you to do that. Uh, through the platform that you're using, uh, you have all these various links, and one of them in the bottom left-hand corner is the ability to download NIME. So uh, it's free. The analytics platform is free. You can try it out. Um, you can download from the community hub uh, these workflows that Emilio and Brian have both mentioned to actually give things a try um, and see what you think. Uh, and we would love to hear your feedback. Uh, again, come visit the thread that we'll have up shortly for this webinar on the forum at forum.nime.com, um, and we can follow up with you there. Having said that, we're a few minutes over, so we will go ahead and wrap today. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the questions, and we hope to see you soon at the next NIME event. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.